I'd like to turn now to Elliot. Um, you are probably still finding the executive washroom at the uh, Charter School District and the reflective building over on Forest Drive. Um, but you have a lot of experience and a lot that you can say to us today because you've also you've been have experience with achievement school districts, but also charter schools. So first of all, give us a lay of the land on where we are in charter schools in South Carolina now. Uh, hearing Mary Wynn earlier today, I thought back to the 80s and the 90s. I remember we had none. North Carolina was booming with charter schools, and we had nothing. But things are going a little better for South Carolina with charter schools, but we're not really quite there yet. So give us a little thumbnail on charter schools, where we are, the, the state of the state, the state of the charter school speech, sure. and then sure. go in a little bit to achievement school districts and how they work. Okay, great. First, can you pull up the cane toad image? Because I didn't. I'm also going to incorporate that. I'm just kidding. Um, so, yeah, I, I feel like I invited my colleague Mary Carmichael from the Charter Alliance up here to talk about the state of state in South Carolina. What I what I know in my first five weeks here is that we've got a, a real vibrant community of educators leading schools um, and schools that have autonomy and freedom um, and make a lot out of that. Um, they're doing it um, in a very entrepreneurial kind of resourceful fashion because they don't they don't get a ton to do this. They don't get a ton of funding. It's a pretty tough context within which to work, um, and yet I've been really uh, pleasantly surprised, frankly, to go around the state and go to a school like Green Charter in Greenville, um, PD Math and Science, which is in, in rural Bishopville. It's not even really Bishopville. It's literally on a dirt road outside of that town um, where these schools are doing great things. Um, Palmetto Scholars Academy in my home city, uh, it's in North Charleston. Um, just have one of the highest ACT scores in the state of South Carolina. So there are a lot of good things happening. We've got about 32 schools in our in our district, um, 18,500 kids, but across the state, I think we're in the mid-60s now. Um, uh, with charter schools, we just got 28 new applications, uh, 28 letters of intent yesterday at our due uh, deadline for letters of intent to open schools in 2017. So there's a lot of interest, a lot of demand um, happening here. So I'm excited about that potential there. And I want to talk a little bit about Tennessee because that's where I spent the last three and a half years um, working to build kind of a new kind of school district, kind of redefine what a school district can look like. And I think the best way to describe it is, is actually um, to tell you the story of when I first got the call um, to come to Tennessee. And I was in Charleston in my house. I was working for the school district. I'd been there four and a half years. I was loving life, wife, kids, living in Charleston. Um, I had never stepped foot in Tennessee, and, and a guy by the name of Ash Solar, who was um, the head of talent for Oakland Unified School District, he called me and he said, you know, you'll never believe where I am. I'm in Nashville. Um, I said, all right. I knew he was a talent guy. He was always trying to recruit people. So my wife was in the house. I said, well, let me just walk on the back porch and hold on a second. I walked back there, um, and he said, you know, Chris Barbick is here, and Chris is the founder of Yes Prep Public Schools in Houston where for 13 straight years, 100% of their kids, 80% of whom qualify for free and reduced lunch, got accepted to four-year colleges. And he said, Chris has just been hired as the new superintendent of a statewide school district. It's going to be called the Achievement School District. It hasn't even started yet, but we're forming a team. And I said, well, tell me what you're thinking. And he said, well, we're going to serve the highest need kids. We will exclusively serve kids that are zoned to the bottom 5% schools in Tennessee, where fewer than one in six kids can read and write. He said, we're going to flow 100% of the resources to them, 100%. And we've got the resources to get this done. I said, we're going to put the power in the community's hands. We're going to put the power in the teacher's hands. I said, OK, you got, you got my attention. He said, our goal is to prove what's possible. So we don't want to just move our schools off of the list. We want to set the goal to move them to the top 25% because we want to create the kinds of schools we'd all be proud to send our own kids to. Um, and then he said, we don't have a school board. And I said, I'm, I'm coming. Um, <laughs> so that's partially true. Um, but yeah, no board. So the point was, we're going to be 100% accountable for our results. I mean, it's on us. We're coming in ground floor to build a new culture. Um, and so three and a half years later, um, you, know, you look at Memphis as a city, Memphis has become this city and it doesn't have everything figured out. I'll start there and say there's a ton of work left to be done. But if you go back to when we started the ASD, and in the ASD we had the authority to authorize nonprofit charter operators to partner with neighborhood schools. And what was really unique about our approach is they stayed neighborhood schools. So unlike most charters where you open up in a new building 
or you might even shut down an existing neighborhood school, the kids get dispersed, and you reopen it as an open enrollment charter. And the ASD, we said, you know what? We're going to go into a neighborhood school, and we're going to partner with that community. Nothing's going to change. The local zone for that school, the attendant zone, 34% of the kids have IEPs. We're going to serve the same exact kids. So for families, there's not going to be any disruption. But I tell you what, will be disrupted. What's going to be disrupted is that system. Because we're going to say no longer are we going to make decisions centrally, you know, and we're going to push them down, top-down mandates to schools. We're going to we're going to let the schools make their own decisions, and we're going to hold them accountable for results. So we actually authorized 14 different nonprofit charter operators to run neighborhood schools in Memphis, and also to open New Start schools that had to serve only kids in the bottom five percent. And so. I mean, I could talk for a couple hours about what that three and a half years meant, community engagement and everything that we learned, but what I'll say is if you go to Memphis now, what you see is really a different city. You already see um, a city that's been fundamentally changed by this effort. I'll give you a few examples. The bottom 5% threshold in Tennessee when we started, when they first ran the list of schools, was 16%. 16 and change. That's basically what the proficiency rate was to be at the bottom 5% school. Three years later, the list just got rerun. It's 25% now. So it's, it's gained nine points in just three years. So it's like harder to get out of the bottom 5% now in Tennessee, which is what we wanted. So the bottom's kind of rising up. The proficiency rate in every single ASD school that was a neighborhood school where we can compare what it was before we came in to now has gone up, every single one. And then the last thing I'd say is, you know, when you look at the schools in Memphis, one thing we didn't really expect was that we really forced the district there to kind of step up their game. Like when we, when we showed up, we started having conversations with the superintendent and his team. And now it's a new superintendent, I named Dorsey Hobson. But we get together with them, and it's a steady collaboration, and we say, okay, we're going to do something about this school over here. What's your plan for that school? And they created an I-Zone when the ASD was first launched that gave that local district some power to say, well, if the ASD doesn't come in, you can do something with it. But if you do that, you have to give the school the same autonomies and hold them accountable to the ASD's goals. And then we made the school improvement grant monies competitive for them. So what we found is in Memphis as a city, we had this friendly competition going with the district where they said, well, we're going to have an I-Zone that's going to be better than you. And we're going to actually go out in the community and convince the community and parents, like, we'll bring the school into the I-Zone instead of you bringing it into the ASD. And we said, okay, let's do that. And if you do better than us, we want you to have more schools. So now there's a whole bunch of the schools that were on that priority list. Um, and when it was first run, by the way, in Tennessee, there were 82 schools in the bottom 5% in 2012. 69 of them were in Memphis. 69. And that's why we decided to really set up shop in Memphis. When you look at that original list, it's down to 11 schools now that don't have some kind of significant intervention where they're in the ASD or they're in the I-Zone or the school's getting top growth. Because we said, well, if the school gets great growth year after year, we'll, we'll let you keep doing what you're doing. So now we've gone from 69 schools in a city that were persistently failing kids where fewer than one in six kids could read or write to now there's only 11 schools left in the city of Memphis that don't really have a clear-cut plan or aren't getting better. And that's what's happening right now this fall with those 11 schools. Well, they're all on our short list, or the ASD short list. They're, they're all being looked at in the district. And so by this time next year, there, there might be zero schools in Memphis um, that aren't either getting much better or are in the ASD. And the final note I'd say in this is just the thing that's starting to happen there that's really phenomenal is if you go to Memphis now, there are all these parent groups. There's a parent group called Memphis Lift, and there are the parents who are in the schools experiencing this. And instead of the ASD this summer knocking on doors, which I spent my first nine months in Tennessee knocking on doors, it's actually the parents in the schools that are in the ASD and in the I-Zone and are getting better who are leading the effort. So they're going out and they're doing all the campaigning and outreach and saying, look what this has done with my child, it's changed my child's life. And they're becoming the voice of the change that's happening there. And I, you know, I feel like if we don't figure out a way for you know, us in this room and us on this panel to not be the voice, but actually the people who are served by this intervention, by this reform, who benefit most from the reform, 
um, then this won't last and won't have an impact. And so just proud to see that starting to happen in Memphis where you can go there and you can stand up in almost any community and you can meet the parents who are actually living this and um, seeing the benefits of it. Let's thank Elliot as well. Thank you.